Today, I'm going to talk about Eve Sweetser's paper, The Definition of Lie, an examination of the folk models underlying a semantic prototype. Now, one thing to note, Eve Sweetser is a linguist, so she does things a little bit differently from philosophers who are the other people whose papers I've mainly been describing here. And in particular, philosophers are often interested in giving necessary and sufficient conditions for when some concept applies. They want to say some instances are instances of the concept and some are not. And Sweetser is going to suggest that we should think about concepts slightly differently. In the description below, I'll link to two other papers by philosophers that are aiming at understanding the concept of lie. Uh, I think each of them has some difficulties. There is one paper by Frederick Siegler from the 1960s, who gives a relatively straightforward analysis of the concept of a lie, but because he doesn't have the ideas from Paul Grice that came a few years later, he has trouble figuring out whether or not something is a lie if its literal meaning is true, but some additional fact that it conveys is false. I'll also link this paper by Jörg Maybauer from 2005, and he spends a lot of time discussing this Gricean idea that what is said and what is implicated might have different informative uh, features about them. And I think, I think the particular suggestion that he comes to is not necessarily one I would agree with, though I think it's an interesting topic for discussion. Maybe someday I'll record those papers as well. But for today, today I'm going to talk about Eve Sweetser's paper. This paper investigates how the semantic structure of one English word depends on and reflects our models of relevant areas of experience. As a linguist, my original concern was the, with the problems posed by the word lie for traditional semantic theories. But these problems led inexorably to the cultural models of informational exchange that motivate the existence of a semantic entity meaning lie. Footnote two. The term folk theory, which I originally used throughout, which she does use in the title, emphasizes the non-expert status of such a theory or model. Cultural model, which I am now adopting, stresses the fact that our cultural framework models the world for us. I've retained the word folk in context where I find it particularly useful. And this is a distinction that comes up often in discussions of psychology or any other related field. For instance, Physicists study how the real world's physics works. But one thing that psychologists often study is how does folk physics work? That is, how do people tend to think physics works? And so what Sweetser is going to be talking about here is what sorts of cultural models do people have in mind that lead them to propose theories of what a lie is? So she says, I begin by, by posing the semantic problem and go on to the cultural solution. And before I move on further, I'll want to say, linguistic analysis is going on at two different levels here. The central topic of the paper is the analysis of the word lie. So that is a linguistic question. What does this word mean? But lying is itself a linguistic concept. It's about something we do with words. And so there's linguistic analysis at this lower level as well. And I think both of these things are going to be relevant to what's going on here. George Lakoff, Fillmore, and Coleman and Kay have argued against traditional generative and structuralist checklists of semantic features that constitute necessary and sufficient conditions for set membership in the category denoted by a word. Lexical categories can have better or worse members or partial members. And here she's mentioning a contrast between these more contemporary cognitive linguists like Lakoff, Fillman, Fillmore, Kay, and others, as opposed to generative and structuralist linguists who use this sharp boundaries idea. And I'll note that the same distinction occurs within philosophy, but most philosophers do tend to aim for these sharp conceptual categories. Though Hilary Putnam does mention the idea that linguists have been considering uh, more fuzzy set membership ideas. So as uh, uh, Sweetser says, lexical categories can have better or worse members. And by lexical categories, she just means a word that is a category of objects that is defined by some word. Lexical means having to do with a word. So that is lexical categories can have better or worse members or partial members. 
Kay and McDaniel have shown that color categories lack necessary and sufficient conditions. That is, red is a gradient quality whose category boundaries are best described by fuzzy set theory rather than by traditional set theory. That is, some objects are clearly red, some objects are clearly not red, but there's a lot of objects where it's unclear whether or not they're really red. Checklist feature definitions, which do not allow for colors being sort of red, must be replaced by a theory capable of dealing with fuzzy set membership. Prototype semantics views word meaning as determined by a central or prototypical application rather than by category boundaries. Clear definitions can thus be given for words with fuzzy boundaries of application. We define the best instance of a word's use and expect real world cases to fit this best example more or less rather than perfectly or not at all. That is in a sort of traditional uh, generative or structuralist or philosophical conceptual analysis, we try to divide all things into two categories, the things that are in this category and the things that are out of it. That seems like the sort of thing that you could do precisely by saying where precisely is the boundary between being inside or being outside. Whereas prototype semantics works differently. We give a precise definition of the best instance of some category, and then everything else counts as a member of the category to the extent that it is similar to that best instance. And so that's how a fuzzy category can still have a precise definition because it can have a precise best member with the fuzziness coming entirely from how well or poorly other instances fit this best member. Coleman and Kay in 1981 show that prototype theory is needed to explain the usage of the verb lie. They did this by presenting subjects with a series of short fictional scenarios, asking the subjects to judge in each case, one, whether a lie had been told in the interaction described, and two, how sure the subject felt about this judgment. The actions described in the scenarios varied independently with respect to deceptiveness, factual falsity of statements made, and speaker's belief of the content of the statements. That is, they told people a whole bunch of stories. In some of those stories, the speaker was trying to deceive the audience member, and in some cases, they weren't. In some scenarios, the speaker was saying things that weren't in fact true, and in other scenarios, they were saying things that were true. In some scenarios, the speaker was saying things that they didn't believe, and in other uh, cases, they uh, were saying things they did believe. And these are the three dimensions that they were analyzing to see which ones contribute how much to whether or not ordinary people decided to call this a lie or not. Okay, so as is natural in prototype semantics, but not in traditional set membership semantics, lying is a matter of more or less. Clear central cases of lies occur when all of Coleman and Kay's proposed conditions are fulfilled. Namely, A, the speaker believes the statement is false. B, the speaker intends to deceive the hearer by making the statement. And C, the statement is false, in fact. If you look at some of the other papers that I've linked in the description below, some of them try to use these categories to define whether or not something is, in fact, a lie. Conversely, a statement fulfilling none of A through C is a clear non-lie. But when only one or two of these, uh, of these conditions A through C hold, speakers are frequently confused and find it difficult to categorize an action as a lie or a non-lie. Further, these conditions, unlike checklist features, differ in weight. A, that is, the speaker not believing it, being strongest, and C, that is the statement actually being false, weakest in influencing speakers' categorization of acts as lies. Prototype semantics has been attentive to the grounding of language in the speaker's world. Kay and McDaniel found physical perceptual reasons for color term universals. Rush and Murders and Rush demonstrate that linguistic categories depend on general human category formation abilities. Fillmore discusses some ways in which the social world shapes word meaning. Bachelor is a classic difficult case. You might have thought that a bachelor is just an unmarried male, but as she notes, why is it difficult to say whether the Pope or a thrice married divorcee can be called a bachelor? Those are both males who are unmarried. The answer, Fillmore says, 
is that bachelor depends on a simplified worldview in which people are marriageable at a certain age, mostly marry at that age, and stay married to the same spouse. In this simplified world, a bachelor is simply any unmarried male past marriageable age. Outside the simplified world, the word bachelor just does not apply. Bachelor necessarily evokes a prototypical schema of marriage within our cultural model of a life history. That is, she's saying, for anyone who's not living in this world where people marry soon after they come of age and uh, stay married forever, uh, anyone who's not in that world is sort of going to be a blurry case for the word bachelor. But in that world, you can just say anyone who's not married who's above that age counts as a bachelor. I argue that like bachelor, lie is inherently grounded in a simplified or prototypical schema of certain areas of human experience. This, I suggest, is why Coleman and Kay found that lie needs a prototype definition. Basing my analysis on their experimental findings, I motivate these findings by relating them to work on discourse pragmatics and conversational postulates. This is where she's going to bring up issues from Grice. It is necessary to examine folk understandings of knowledge, evidence, and proof. That is, what do people think knowledge, evidence, and proof are, whether or not they really are that. Our cultural model of language, or at least of lying, cannot be analyzed independently of beliefs about information. I hope to show that lie has a simpler definition than has been thought, in a, but in a more complex context. Since the cultural model context for a definition of lie is independently necessary, our analysis is simplified overall. That is, she's going to say the definition of a lie is just a false statement, but that definition only works in a certain kind of simplified cultural context. And then all the complexities of the meaning of the word lie depend on the ways in which the real world is not like that simplified context. This is just how the word bachelor has a simple definition when you're in the special world where everyone gets married at the right age and stays married, but becomes more complex and interesting in the real world where people violate some of these assumptions and where the cultural assumptions are untrue. Okay, a cultural model of language. Is there a simplified prototypical speech act world as there is a simplified marriage history? Although such a world has not been examined in detail, Kay suggests that the word technically evokes a folk theory of language use that assumes that experts are the arbiters of correct word use. Grice's conversational maxims and Searle's felicity conditions, she's mentioning Searle here, though some of these ideas probably go back to Austin, are constraints on the appropriateness of utterances. Speakers are assumed to follow these rules in the default situation. Kay's folk theories, Grice's maxims, and Searle's felicity conditions all describe parts of our cultural understanding of discourse interaction. Grice's be as informative as necessary, for example, is a maxim of which speakers are conscious. One can criticize an interlocutor for informational insufficiency. But informational content is irrelevant to a speech activity such as joke telling. Robin Lakoff's work on politeness rules and Goffman's work on frame semantics show that conversation often has its primary purposes at the level of social interaction. Making someone happy or negotiating the interaction frame may be a more important goal than informativeness. The in maxim of informationality is thus binding precisely to the degree that we consider ourselves to be operating in a simplified world in which discourse is informational, so that the default purpose of an utterance is not joking, politeness, or frame bargaining. Our covert discourse purposes are only made possible by a cultural model that establishes our overt purpose as informational. Frame bargaining and most indirect speech depend on having direct speech say something else. I sketch some relevant aspects of our folk understanding of informational language use, and then use this cultural model to explain the meaning of lie as presented by Coleman and Kay. First, let us posit two basic principles as parts of our model of general social interaction, rather than of our mo specific model of speech acts. These principles, which are assumed to operate in the default case, like Gricean maxims, are one, 
try to help, not harm. And two, knowledge is beneficial. Together, the two principles yield the result that giving knowledge, since it is beneficial, is part of a general goal of helping others. Thus, in cases in which two is true, one, try to help, translates at least partly as three, try to inform others. So that is here, she's starting to give us the assumptions that she says ordinary speakers usually have built into their folk model of what's going on when we speak. They usually assume that we're trying to help each other, not harm, and that knowledge is beneficial. Of course, in the real world, things are often more complex than that. The rules just proposed constitute the cultural motivation for a folk understanding of language as informational. That is, if these two assumptions are usually in place, that explains why people usually abide by Grice's maxim, be as informative as uh, necessary. Before going on to a folk theory of knowledge and information, one issue needs clarification. The status of these cultural models or folk theories. What does it mean to say that language is assumed to be informational in the default case? I do not mean that purely informational discourse is statistically more common than or acquisitionally prior to other kinds of discourse. Indeed, it would be hard to separate discourse modes cleanly since one utterance may have multiple purposes. However, the informational mode is the direct mode on which indirect speech is parasitic. And it may be viewed as more basic in the sense that all discourse involves the conveyance of information, if only about a speaker's intentional state, whereas not all discourse participates in all of the other purposes of language use. Our cultural model presents this basic discourse mode, which is a vehicle for other modes, as being, in its pure form, the unmarked mode, the norm. That is, you might have thought that what she means by the default case is that most of the time people are making statements rather than telling jokes, being polite, negotiating friendships, or doing all these other things. But she's not going to say that there's some statistical uh, fact to that matter. In fact, depending on how much we believe John Austin, it may be that statements are actually only a very tiny fraction of what we're doing with language. However, she's claiming this ordinary informational model of making statements is thought of in the folk theory at any rate as the default mode of speech. And this might be right, but she's saying all other modes of speech somehow depend for their functioning on the idea that the default mode of speech is giving people information. This is an interesting question that we might think more about. Unlike maxims and conditions, this cultural model does not constitute rules of language use, but rather beliefs about what we do when we use language. These beliefs in turn make general social rules applicable to the domain of discourse. Grice's maxim of informationality is the manifestation of a general help not harm maxim in a simplified folk model world in which information is always helpful. Now on to our cultural model of information, a folk theory of information and evidence. Any truth conditional semantics assumes that we can know the propositional content of true statements. This begs the vexed question of what knowledge is. I intend to pass over the philosopher's view of knowledge and instead examine our cultural idea of what counts as knowledge, since this is what underlies our understanding of lies and truths and discourse. Clearly, we do not imagine that all of our beliefs can be proven logically. Nonetheless, we consider our beliefs sufficiently justified, and we are not really worried that their truth is not known from logical proof. Few of us speakers know formal logic or from personal experience. That is, in the ordinary case, most of us believe a bunch of things, and we think that these beliefs count as knowledge, even if we know that in some sense there's some greater concept of justification that might be needed. Evaluation of evidence is thus frequently an important issue. Knowledge is not so much a relationship between a fact, that is a true proposition, and a knower, as a socially agreed on evidential status given by a knower to a proposition. Rappaport demonstrates just how social the difference between statement and truth, between belief and knowledge, really is. 
he observes that a normative standard of truthfulness in informational exchange is essential to ensure that our belief system and our social existence is not constantly undermined by distrust of new input. That is, we have to have this standard that normally people are saying true things in order to actually be able to trust what we hear and uh, update our beliefs. However, the fact that we treat this as normal doesn't, it means actual statistical likelihood of a random statement's truth is irrelevant to this norm. That is, we don't have to count how many times have people said things and what fraction of those times have they been true in order to figure out whether or not saying true things is normal. Normality is this cultural idea, not a statistical idea. He argues that a central function of liturgy and ritual is to transform a statement or a belief into accepted universal truth. That is, into something that can be unconditionally believed and treated as reliable. Rappaport is mainly concerned with social facts, not with such falsifiable information as Ed is in Ohio. But let's remember that knowledge has many socially acceptable, valid sources, and that we do not in fact tidally separate messy socially based knowledge from clean falsifiable facts. We know that promises can get broken, yet certain ritual aspects of oaths and promises still make us treat them as extra trustworthy, maintaining our social norm of truthfulness. That is, if you want to tell someone something and you really want them to believe you, you can say, I promise, uh, even though you might be saying, it's going to rain tomorrow, I promise. You're not promising to make it rain. You're just somehow saying that this is an extra true thing. Uh, or take a modern scholar who knows Marx's or Adam Smith's economic teachings. This knowledge may seem to a cynic as faith-based, as religious belief, but that does not prevent a whole community of social scientists from acting on it as fact. Hard scientific knowledge and evidence often turn out to be as paradigm dependent as social science argumentation. You might think back to all of the information we had and that has changed over the past year about whether viruses can be spread uh, through surfaces or through the air. Some of this may have actually just been based on faith rather than empirical tests. What is crucial is not whether scientists always have objectively true hypotheses, but that any society agrees on a range of socially acceptable methods of justifying belief. Without such agreement, intellectual cooperation would be impossible. And this sort of question of what, how do we agree on what are the socially acceptable methods of justifying things is clearly an important question for the current world, especially as we know that the, the methods that we have agreed on are imperfect and flawed, just like any methods are. So much of what she's describing here is, what is the standard cultural assumption about justifiability and how does that play into the standard cultural assumption about what knowledge is? And how does that play into the standard cultural assumption about what lying is? She's, understand, she's trying to investigate what do ordinary speakers think a lie is, rather than trying to give some philosophical analysis of what a lie really is, if there even is such a thing. So what counts as evidence or authority is thus a cultural question. In reply to a college student's scoffs at a medieval philosopher who appealed to classical authority, I once heard a professor ask how the student knew what Walter Cronkite had told him. Uh, maybe modern uh, audiences are less trusting of the news than people in the 1980s or 1970s. But, uh, but I think the point is the same, that there are cultural standards of what people can be assumed to trust and that these standards change over time. Whether that makes these things actually trustworthy, that's a separate question that she's not investigating. Many natural languages formally mark with evidential markers the difference between direct and indirect linguistically or logically mediated experience and or between various sensory modalities as sources of a statement's information. That is, uh, just as English marks the difference between a verb in the present tense and a verb in the past tense or 
a verb that is done by the first person or a verb that is done by the second person or a verb that is done by the third person. Uh, some languages mark the difference between a verb describing something that I saw myself versus something that I heard someone tell me versus something that I read about in a book versus something that I put together by gathering other pieces of information. Some priority or preference seems to be given universally to both direct experience, especially visual, and culturally accepted universal truths. But failing these best sources of universal truth or personal experience, we trust some input more than others, and we constantly make non-logical deductions based on our observations of correlations in the world. We do not bother to distinguish these generally trustworthy deductions from fact except when observed correlations break down and deductions fail. Whatever our rules of practical everyday inference are like, we trust them in the default case. Thus, belief is normally taken as having adequate justification and hence as equivalent to knowledge, which would entail truth. Gordon demonstrates the close complex relationship of belief and knowledge in our cultural understanding. He shows that in adult as well as, as, well as child use, factivity of verbs such as know is not fixed, especially if the person said to know is not the speaker. That is, whereas philosophers usually say, you can't know something unless it's true, ordinary speakers sometimes do uh, use the word know, like they might say, uh, before astronomers figured things out, everyone knew the earth was flat. Philosophers don't like that usage, but ordinary speakers do. And that's what she's talking about here, that the word no is sometimes used as connected to the word belief. A theory of knowledge as a cultural status given to certain beliefs is more compatible with this flexibility than is a theory of knowledge as a link between an objective fact and a person's mind. That is, she's saying, when we say before the development of astronomy, everyone knew the earth was flat, what we might be meaning is that everyone believed this and they didn't just believe it for no good reason, they believed it out of some trust of some cultural universal, which is one of the sorts of default things that we tend to trust. In our cultural model of knowledge, the default case is thus for belief to entail justification and hence truth. Conversely, untruth will entail lack of evidence and impossibility of belief. That is in the ordinary case, we assume people believe true things and they don't believe false things. Let us combine these entailments with the informational model of language. That is the picture she was talking about on the previous page where the general default goal of language is to inform people because information is helpful. I start with a norm establishing meta maxim, zero. People normally obey rules. This is the default case. One general cooperative rule is one rule, try to help not harm. Combined with a belief such as two, the knowledge is beneficial or helpful, we can instantiate one as a Gricean conversational rule of informativeness, as in three. Rule, give knowledge, inform others, do not misinform. Our model, this model of knowledge and information gives us the following proof of six from four and five. Four is this default assumption that most people's beliefs have adequate justification. And second default assumption, adequately justified beliefs are knowledge. That is, they are true. Putting these together, we get the general conclusion that by default, things that people believe are true and are knowledge. And six allows us to reinterpret our helpfulness rule yet again. If the rule was initially try to help and that knowledge is beneficial, then the rule becomes give knowledge. And if beliefs tend to be knowledge, then the rule becomes say what you believe since belief equals knowledge. Do not say what you do not believe because this is generally by default misinformation. The hearer in this cultural model is presumed ready to believe the speaker. Why refuse help from a speaker who is assumed to be not only helpful, but also well-informed having well-justified beliefs? This is on the basis of the default assumption that people follow the rules. Putting together the whole chain of entailments, we reach the startling conclusion that in the simplified world of this default cultural model, the speaker's saying something entails the truth of the thing said. That is, if S says something, 
then because people usually follow the rules and our rules lead to people believe, saying what they believe, then the speaker should believe something. And then using this further set of deductions from the default rules, therefore we can conclude that this thing is true. Logically, outside our model, or even statistically, this conclusion is rubbish. That is, just because someone says something doesn't mean it's true. And we all know that on some level. But as a folk model of language by which we all operate from day to day, it makes good sense. In fact, it seems doubtful that we could ever live our lives questioning the truth of every statement presented to us. We question truth if we fear that our simplified discourse world is too far from reality, when our source might be ill-informed, a broken link between belief and justification, or naive, breaking the entailment between justification and truth, or might want to deceive us, invalidating our assumption that folks are out to help and so wish to inform correctly. Note that even in these cases, the usual cultural model is in effect. We know our interlocutor expects us to take what is said as an instance of information giving. But in general, we do take people's word. The next section examines cases in which we should not take someone's word. We now look at lying in the simplified discourse setting established by our cultural understanding of linguistic exchange as information. Prevarication in a simplified world. Coleman and Kay proposed three components of a prototype definition of lie. The, the speaker believes the statement to be false. The speaker said it with the intent to deceive. And the statement is false in fact. Now, in the simplified world we have outlined, any one of these conditions would entail the others. In particular, if we assume both a folk model of evidence in which a speaker's belief constitutes evidence of truth and a model of discourse as informational intending to be believed, then we find that a factually false statement must be known to be false by the speaker. And if made, must be intended to induce false belief and thus to deceive. The reasoning runs as follows. Premise, X is false. Therefore, X did, S did not believe X since beliefs are true. Therefore, S intended to misinform since we know that in order to inform, one says only what one believes. Further, assuming that even uninformative speakers do not randomly discuss areas in which they have no beliefs, that is people act purposefully, this may be another default assumption. We can go beyond S did not believe X to assert S believed X to be false. Note that there's a difference between just having no belief about something and actively believing the opposite of that thing. And in this cultural model, we can assume that if someone says something that is in fact false, they probably have a belief about this thing. And since their belief is probably justified and correct, then that means they probably intended to deceive us. Maybe I shouldn't say probably, I should say normally. We did not premise the meta maxim that S is obeying the rules, since S's obedience to the cooperative principle is precisely what we are trying to prove or disprove. Figure 2.1, this big diagram here, gives a taxonomy of speech settings. The box on the right encloses the idealized informational discourse world. Lie must be defined within this restricted world. Outside of the world, this world, the word lacks application. Only within this world can the hearer properly link utterance with informativeness, sincerity, and factual truth. So let's look at this diagram a bit. Uh, she's got this background assumption up here, help don't harm, leading to this set of principles, information is helpful in telling the truth. And so now we consider there's this taxonomy, all possible actions you could do. Some actions are nonverbal, in fact, most actions are probably nonverbal, but some actions involve words, those are the speech acts. Within the speech acts, we have many types of speech acts, we have asking questions, we have giving orders, we have all the other things that John Austin talks about. But among them, we have making statements. Now, within the making statements case, we have two types of cases again, some types of statements where the truth value is not relevant and some where the truth value is relevant. And in the not relevant cases, we have things like someone might be telling a story, it might be fiction, they might be telling a joke, it's entertainment. They might be just merely trying to be polite. And again, truth value may not be relevant here. Uh, whereas in the cases where truth value is relevant, 
speakers are supposed to give knowledge. There are some cases in which the speaker doesn't know what they're saying, and there are other cases in which the speaker does know what they're saying. And these cases where we're making statements, the truth value is relevant, and the speaker does know what's being said, that is the default case. That's why this box is here. And in the default case, we have the distinction between if you say something that's true, you're telling the truth, and if you say something that's false, you're lying. Because in this default case, you're trying to inform the person and you have knowledge. So if you say something false, then it must be that you are believing it false and intending to deceive. However, in the cases where you don't know what's going on, there's cases where you happen to say something true, and that's weirdly anomalous to say something where you don't know what's going on, but you get it right by chance. Or in cases where you don't know, you might say something false. It might be that you have adequate evidence and you happen to be wrong. That's an honest mistake. Or you might not have adequate evidence. And in that case, you made a careless mistake. And then she notes out of the lies, she's going to distinguish social lies and white lies, which we'll talk about a bit later. But you might come back to this diagram and spend more time looking at it if you are interested. OK, but only within this world where you're making statements where the truth value is relevant and where the speaker is informed uh, that lying gets its prototypical definition. Other cases will count as lies to a greater or lesser degree to the extent they resemble that case. The feature. Truth value relevant on the tree indicates that the informational exchange view of language is in effect. When truth value is relevant, knowledge is beneficial and informing is helpful. Plus no indicates that our folk theory of knowledge and evidence is in effect. When belief is justified and hence true, the speaker can be assumed to have knowledge about what is said. Thus, we can define a lie as a false statement if we assume that the statement occurs in a prototypical informational speech setting. This definition is elegant and will also help explain why native speakers tend to define a lie as a false statement. That is, not only is this the first definition given out of the blue by many speakers, but it is, according to Piaget, also common for children to pass through a stage in which lie is used to denote any false statement. Wimmer and Perner's unpublished data, more recent experimental work, shows that children up to age nine class good faith false statements and lies as alike even when they themselves are being tricked into being the good faith false informers. Four-year-olds understand sabotage, physical manipulation to obstruct a precondition of an opponent's goal well, but five-year-olds are only starting to understand manipulation of an opponent's belief system. That is sabotage, people understand well how you sabotage someone's physical uh, activities, but it's much harder to understand how you can sabotage someone's belief system. The social motivations of such manipulation entail an understanding of the speech setting as social interaction. Children only come to differentiate lies from other falsehoods as they learn the sociocultural background of speaking and acquire the folk theories that are a backdrop to the more restricted adult use of lie as a false statement made in a certain world. Footnote. Susan Irvin Tripp has suggested to me that young children are simply behaviorists, judging acts by result, not by intent. Before children can state their intentions, they're bound to get rewarded and punished behavioristically. Four to nine-year-olds are certainly not insensitive to intentions, but may remain behaviorist enough to class lies with other false statements. So that is, this footnote is giving a different explanation of why it is that children think all false statements are lies. Uh, that is, children may not really be thinking of classifying things by the intention with which the person does them. They may be just thinking, if you did something with a good result, it's good. If you did something with a bad result, it's bad. And if you said something that happened to be false, that's bad, regardless of what you're believing. So that might be the explanation. Uh, but she's saying here, maybe another thought is that children just haven't fully internalized the fact that you can get people to believe things falsely. A fascinating parallel to child usage is found in Gulliver's explanation of lying to the Huygens. This is in the book Gulliver's Travels. And I think these Huygens are horses that, uh, that he meets. His definition of a lie, saying the thing which is not, is perfectly comprehensible to him, but proves incomprehensible to the Huygens, precisely because, as Gulliver says, 
They have little experience of deception in any area. They lack the sociocultural background that makes a falsehood a lie. Adult English speakers like Gulliver have a complex set of possible discourse worlds, if we look back at that previous figure. It is not strange that in one setting, where the truth value is relevant but the speaker doesn't know, a false statement should be called a mistake, whereas in another setting, where the truth value is relevant and the speaker does know, a false statement is a lie. Thus, the simple definition of a lie as a false statement is natural, given our, an understanding of our cultural model of knowledge and discourse. The taxonomy of speech settings in figure 2.1 also motivates the order of Coleman and Kay's three features. First, it is clear why factual falsity is the least important feature. Outside of the prototypical informational speech environment, falsehood is not particularly connected with lying. We shall see that lies moral status also depends on this setting. For now, suffice it that we experience a false statement differently when factors like truth relevance vary. In a sense, lying is closer to telling the truth than to joking, although jokes are often factually false. That is, she's saying, the important features are the ones that determine what setting we're in. And then actually being false, even though that's the prototypical definition of lying, she says that's the least important feature because it only applies when the others already are there. Coleman and Kay's most important feature, the speaker's belief that the statement is false, corresponds to my plus or minus no branching. So let's see that. That is uh, right here. Do we know or not? Uh, given that a statement is false, another Coleman and Kay feature, the speaker's correct belief in its falsity merely constitutes full and correct information, the informational part of our simplified cultural model of discourse. Being the first tree branching above the box and closing the simplified world, this feature is most important in speakers' judgments as to whether we are in that world, and hence whether the term lie applies. The next tree branching, plus or minus truth value relevant, corresponds to Coleman and Kay's intent to deceive. A falsehood can only intend to deceive if truth value is assumed to be relevant, that is where the information is beneficial, and not if we're joking or storytelling. This branching is above the plus or minus no branching and farther from the break between the simplified world and other worlds. So it is a less important feature in a definition that crucially depends on that break. This is an interesting argument she's giving. I'm not sure I'm totally convinced by this argument that the, the closer a branch is above to the context we're talking about, the more important people will perceive that branch as being. It seems weird that you would perceive the branch above it as more important than the branch within it. But that's what she's claiming. Coleman and Kay's least important feature is the definitional one, factual falsity. In the environment of their experiment, which actively stretch speakers' consideration beyond the prototypical informational setting, falsehoods does not distinguish lies as a unified class. Within the simplified world, however, truth value criterially distinguishes between the two possible kinds of speech act. Hence, falsehood becomes the defining characteristic of lie and native speakers reasonably cite it as such. So that's an interesting point. Here she's explaining why is it that the least important of the three features in Coleman and Kay's experiment is the one that if you ask someone what's a lie, that's the answer they'll first give. It's saying something false. It's only when you think about it more sophisticatedly that you come up with the two more important features. Thomason, who also tries to ground Coleman and Kay's analysis in the speech setting, adds two more features to the semantic prototype of lie, unjustifiability of belief and reprehensibleness of motive. However, he himself remarks that unjustified belief in the truth of X directly conflicts with the speaker believes X is false, which he retains. How could both be part of the meaning of lie? Under my analysis, the general maxims in joining us to inform will also condemn misinformation, even if not deliberate. Thus, unjustified statements will automatically be judged as like lies in some ways without changing our definition of lie as a false statement in a prototypical inform informative setting. Mere unjustified, sincere belief does not, however, greatly contribute to my actual classification of even a false statement as a lie. Furthermore, if unjustified belief were part of a definition of lie, then even true, sincere, unjustified statements would have to be considered lies to some degree. 
not a promising result of an admittedly self-contradictory definition of lie. The informationality maxims give a more general coherent explanation of any perceived likeness between lies and unjustified statements. We shall see that Thomason's proposed feature of reprehensibility also follows from a more general understanding of informational exchange and is superfluous to a definition of lie. Notice how rules and maxims change form as they change setting. The general help don't harm is manifested as inform others in the setting in which information or truth is the most relevant beneficial factor. In the domain of politeness, the same general super maxim is manifested as Robin Lakoff's politeness rules. This model agrees, I think, with our experience. Both information and politeness are considered good and helpful in their contexts, although in the fact the two may conflict when we are unsure which setting takes priority. A lie, then, is a false statement made in a simplified informational exchange setting. All rules enjoining veracity are in effect, that is, all rules telling us to tell the truth are in effect, and the speaker is a fully knowledgeable imparter of information to a credulous hearer, someone who's going to believe what's said. Lie has a simple definition within a matrix of cultural models that are independently necessary. The prototype seems to be in the context rather than in the definition itself. Speakers have difficulty judging whether an action is a lie when they're not sure the action setting sufficiently matches the prototypical setting specified by the cultural model of informational exchange. Paul Kay has brought to my attention a playful usage that seems odd in the context of either a feature or a prototype analysis of lie. You know, I thought I told the truth the other day, but it turns out I lied to you, I'm so sorry. This usage seems to me parasitical on serious usage in that the speaker jokingly attributes to a past speech act his or her current mental knowledge base in Fauconnier's sense of mental space. Since past acts are not actually judged in light of the subsequently gained knowledge, we find this amusing. And that's interesting. I think, uh, uh, I think this sort of usage has come, become much more common. I've definitely met people who say, oops, I lied, I meant this when they just meant to say, oops, I said something false. This is what I should have said. Less simplified, oh yeah, the next section fits a larger sector of English vocabulary into the cultural model we have outlined. I then go on to motivate our moral condemnation of lying in terms of our cultural models as well. Less simplified worlds, less simple words. English has words for false non-lies and palliated or justified lies. These words mark deviations from the simplified world of the cultural model. Thus, examining the deviations may elucidate the model. Common terms include white lie, social lie, exaggeration, oversimplification, tall tale, fiction, fib, and honest or careless mistake, some of which appear in figure 2.1. First, as stressed in the previous section, a lie is not committed if truth is irrelevant. Thus, jokes, kidding, or pulling someone's leg, which exist in a world where humor rather than information is the basic goal, are outside the informational model and cannot be considered lies. Of course, every culture also has a model for humor, and humorous discourse, like all speech, uses some aspects of the informational model. When we cannot decide which model predominates in a given situation, we ask the common and intelligible question, how serious was that remark? Seriousness characterizes contexts, not statements. The same remark may be serious or not, depending on the context. Since interlocutors constantly negotiate context, including the predominance of informational versus humorous goals, one may ask about a statement's seriousness, meaning the speaker's perception of its micro discourse context. Tall tales, fiction, and fantasy, when not referring to literature, palliate falsehoods, they make them less bad, by looking at them as literary rather than as prototypically informational. The discourse in question is looked at more as a story with a goal of artistic entertainment than as facts with relevant truth values. Grandpa's tall tales of 50-foot snowfalls in his childhood are fun and harmless. Similar claims in a history book, however, would be mistakes to say the least. Tall tales of huge fish I caught are lies if we're still on the fishing trip and I convince you there's fish for dinner when there is not. 
I personally only use fantasy and fiction to refer to literature or to internal unspoken fantasizing. When fantasy refers to a false statement, however, it seems not only to mean a more artistic story than the truth, but also to include an element of self-deception that further palliates the offense of deceiving others. Any departure from the prototypical informational setting, such as weakened truth value relevance, literary, not informative goals, or less complete control of facts by the speaker, as in when they're self-deceived, can make the difference between our judging a falsehood as a lie within the simplified informational world, or as something else in some other world, such as a tall tale. That is, saying I caught a fish this big could be a lie if I'm telling you what we're going to have for dinner, but it's just a tall tale. It's just a tall tale if I'm talking about a trip I did last year. Mistakes are cases in which, without speaker's knowledge, the normal chain of entailment from belief to truth breaks down. Both speaker and hearer think they are in the simplified world delineated by cultural models of knowledge and evidence, but there is an unknown deviation. For an honest mistake in particular, the entailment between belief and evidence does hold. The speaker has normally sufficient reason to believe what we said. Carelessness is charged if the broken entailment is between belief and evidence. The speaker should have realized the evidence was insufficient, but failed to. Speakers are responsible for evaluating evidence, so we blame irresponsibility where we would not blame an honest mistake. In either case, however, we assume that the rules ought to hold. Mistake marks a disruption of our simplified informational world's assumptions, rather than an agreed on suspension in favor of other goals, as in the case of a joke. Lie, on the other hand, denotes a wrong moral choice with no disruption or suspension of the informational model. As further indication that speech acts are subcases of actions rather than some separate parallel category, note that the same word mistake denotes both an unintentional falsehood and a wrong turn taken or a typo. Ideally, we should be able to justify any act, speech or otherwise. The graver the consequences, the higher the standards for justification. But blameless wrong choices do occur. And if we did our best with available information and resources, unintentional harm can be forgiven. The category mistake is a recognition of human frailty as an allowable out. In exaggerations, oversimplifications, understatements, and other distortions, the informational exchange rules are more or less consciously bent rather than suspended or disrupted. Such cases do not strictly follow the dictates of our cultural model. We feel we are being less informational, less truthful than we might be, hence less helpful. But distortions are not necessarily in direct opposition to truth. They may indicate a subjective personal reaction better than the strict truth could, and hence be truthful at another level. Or it may be more informational for an expert to oversimplify than to fail totally to communicate with a non-expert. Many such distortions are indisputably literally false. This is what happens, for instance, when a physics teacher tells students that Newton's laws are how objects move. That is literally false, but it is an oversimplification of the complex theories of modern physics, rather than saying something. I mean, it's literally false, but it's still better than trying to tell uh, high school kids about all the details of relativity and quantum mechanics. It's better to give them the nearly true but false thing than you can inform them better in that way. Whether we judge them as lies depends on one, whether the setting is prototypically informational, and two, if so, whether they advance or obstruct the informational goals of interaction. That is, we don't usually say that we're lying to students when we teach them the oversimplified first version of a theory. Although sometimes professors and teachers do talk that way in a joking way amongst each other, we say we're lying to the students uh, today uh, when we're telling them the oversimplified thing. White lies and social lies are generally like lies, but they occur in settings in which information might harm rather than help. They are still called lies, even non-reprehensible, deliberate misinformation counts as a lie. In these cases, the entailments of speaker's knowledge, evidence, and intent to be believed seriousness still hold. Likewise, the super maxim help don't harm holds, but the useful, usual helpfulness of truth cannot be assumed. 
for a social lie, the politeness maxims have superseded the injunction to truthfulness. Truth is seen as more harmful to the social situation than minor misinformation would be. In the case of white lies, truth might harm in some other, sometimes more direct way. Some people would call it a white lie to tell a dying person whatever he or she needs to hear to die in peace. Some speakers would also call a less altruistic lie told in self-defense a white lie if it helped them and hurt nobody else. As with politeness, self-defense is clearly only supposed to be allowed to supersede the informational mode if the consequences of the resulting deception are small. The compounds white lie and social lie show in their two elements the conflicting worlds in which the actions take place. It is a lie as an informational utterance, but it is also a social utterance. Figure 2.1 puts them under more than one heading to show this dual categorization. If we flip back, uh, we'll see here, the social lie occurs in the politeness setting, but also occurs in this setting where informativeness is relevant. The white lie occurs in the general action setting, maybe it's self-defense, uh, but also in this informational setting. For a social lie, oh yes, figure 2.1 puts them under more than one heading to show this dual categorization. Lakoff in press, I'm not sure if this is Robin or George Lakoff here, comments that social lie and similar collocations pose problems for the theory of complex categories. A prototypical social lie is not necessarily a prototypical lie. Without proposing a new theory of complex categories, I feel it is clear that social lie is not an intersection of the categories lie and social act. Rather, it is viewed simultaneously and perhaps somewhat contradictory as a member of two categories that we do not usually understand as interacting at all. Here, there's a whole discussion about how do compound words work. Like a blue truck is a blue thing that is also a truck. However, there are some adjectives that don't work that way. Like for instance, a fake duck is not a fake thing that is also a duck. It is something that is not a duck, but is instead a fake duck. A social lie is not necessarily something that is as close to paradigmatic a lie and as close to paradigmatic a social statement as possible. It may have its own paradigm. And so she's suggesting a different way that these paradigm concepts or prototypical concepts should combine rather than just intersecting. Intersecting only works for the set membership model. There are lies which most people would think justified by some higher good achieved, but which would not be called white lies, since their informational consequences are too major, however moral, for us to diminish their status as lies. I would think it moral to lie to the Gestapo about the location of a Jew, but I would call that an unqualified lie. The informational paradigm is fully, even saliently, in effect in this instance. It is only that we feel our uncooperativeness to be justified. Last and least, a fib is a small or inconsequential lie, and thus a palliated offense, since the seriousness of an offense of lying is a function of its harmful consequences. However, a fib is nonetheless an offense, though minor, in that it is considered to have at most only a selfish and unimportant reason for overriding the usual motivations for veracity. This brings us to the question of the importance of a falsehood or a deception. As Coleman and Kay observe, we can only judge major versus minor deviations from the truth in terms of human consequences. They contrast an error in the millions column of a city's population, a deception, with an error in the ones column, no deception, because it has no serious consequences. That is, if I tell you that New York has 10,805,003 people, that would be a lie, that would be deceptive. Whereas if I tell you it has 8,700,086 people, uh, that would uh, not really be a deception because that's basically the truth. It is clearly only felt allowable to override the truth is beneficial maxim, when the truth violation could have no negative consequences as serious as the negative results of truthfulness. A social lie cannot be justified as polite and as helpful if it gravely and harmfully misinforms. When truth is more important than politeness, the informational mode cannot be overridden. This merely repeats that our judgment of a lie depends on the extent to which the relevant cultural models are in effect. Knowledge as power, 
the morality of lying. The cultural models relevant to lying also help explain the generally accepted reprehensibility of lies. Coleman and Kay, noting that a lie is no more or less a lie because of reprehensible motives on the speaker's part, consider my Gestapo example as a case of a real lie with good motives, decide that such motives are typical rather than prototypical of lying. Uh, that is, the prototype is the thing that defines the concept, whereas what's typical isn't taken as definitive, even if it's normal. That is, lies tend in the real world to be selfishly motivated, just as real surgeons currently tend to be male. But one cannot claim that maleness is in any way part of the meaning of surgeon. The prototype of a surgeon is someone who cuts people open to do medical operations in a well-trained and whatever way. And we can see that some people may partially fit that uh, uh, definition. And However, those partial deviations from that prototype are going to matter much more than the deviations from the stereotype of, say, being male and from a privileged background. Placed in the framework of cultural models of discourse and information, the variable reprehensibility of lies follows naturally. To the extent that information really is beneficial at a higher level and false information harmful, a lie will harm general social judgments will condemn deliberately harmful actions. Thomason disagrees that lies are typically reprehensibly motivated. He suggests that social lies are the most common sort of lie and are non-reprehensible. I differ with him. Social lies are rarely altruistic, though their element of selfishness may not be deeply harmful. And their statistical predominance is unprovable, as a valid survey is surely impossible in this domain. Coleman and Kay correctly reflect a folk understanding that deceit usually profits the deceiver to the listener's detriment. Thomason's wish to include reprehensibility in the prototype of lie shows that he shares this folk belief in a deep connection between deceit and harmfulness. So I think here uh, she's saying that being reprehensible is just a typical phenomenon of lies and that we're happy to count things as lies, even if they're intended in a good way. That's the category social lie and white lie indicates. Uh, whereas Thomason thinks that this is part of the prototype and that something that isn't reprehensible is in some way not a lie, just as something that isn't false is in some way not a lie, even if it has all the other features. This deep judgment of falsehoods as inherently harmful goes beyond what we can so far predict from cultural models examined. Our informational exchange model would ask us to condemn falsehood only when, in fact, truth is beneficial and misinformation harmful, so that the simplified world is in effect. I now turn to an examination of the cultural links between information and power in order to explain why a stigma of immorality attaches to even well-intentioned prevarication. Let us first examine what we do in making an ordinary informational statement, true or false. Robin Lakoff's rules of politeness, now recognized as a necessary part of our understanding of speech acts are, one, don't impose formality. Two, give options, hesitancy. Three, make interlocutor feel good, be friendly, equality or camaraderie. Lakoff says two, giving options or hesitancy explains why a direct command is less polite than an indirect command with a surface form of a request or a query about the hearer's willingness or ability to do the task. That is, uh, it might be, it's considered more polite to ask, could you pass the salt, than to say, pass the salt, or to say, uh, and it's even considered a little in between to say, I would like you to pass the salt, or I would like the salt, rather than to tell the person to pass the salt. And that explains, that's because these, you're giving people a bit more options, or at least you're appearing to give people uh, more options. Indirect forms like these questions or uh, requests give the hearer options besides obedience or disobedience. The hearer can negatively answer a query about ability without having to refuse compliance directly. That is, if I ask you, could you pass the salt? You might say, oh no, sorry, I'm in the process of doing this other thing. I can't. Alternatively, indirectness allows compliance without implicit acceptance of the felicity conditions of a command and recognition of the speaker's authority. 
hedged commands avoid assuming ungranted authority over an addressee. That is, if I say, give me the salt, I'm assuming that I have the right to demand that of you. Whereas if I ask, could you pass the salt, I'm not stating that I have that authority. Only people with authority can command, whereas anyone can question. Without details of the motivation, Lakoff also says that the same factors make it more polite to qualify assertions with, I guess, or sorta. This seems a puzzle at first. Why should it be more polite to guess than to assert, or to make a hedged assertion rather than an unhedged one? Statements have so many purposes that the issue is messier than for commands. But the answer, as Lakoff at least implicitly noticed, is that a statement does something to the hearer, just like other speech acts. It pushes at the hearer's belief system. An informative speaker requires a hearer ready and willing to believe, or information cannot be imparted. The cooperative hearer grants the speaker a good deal of power to push around certain aspects of his or her belief systems. Social rights and responsibilities are reciprocally arranged. If the speaker has the right or the authority to say X, then the hearer has a duty to believe it. If H has a special right to hear or to know X beyond the general right to information, then S has a correspondingly more important duty to tell X to H. English reflects the equation of knowledge with power in the uses of a group of hedges that mark the evidential status of statements. Some examples of evidentiality hedges are, to the best of my knowledge, so far as I know, if I'm not mistaken, as far as I can tell, for all I know, as I understand it, my best guess is, speaking conservatively, at a conservative estimate, to put it mildly, beyond question. The literal use of these hedges is to limit the speaker's normal responsibility for the truth of assertions. An assertion has the precondition that the speaker be able to provide evidence for its truth. Or in terms of our cultural models of information and evidence, in an informational setting, a hearer knows that a cooperative speaker will only state justified beliefs. However, even reliable looking evidence can turn out to be insufficient. Evidentiality hedges allow the hearer access to the evidence evaluation and thus transfer some of the speaker's evaluative responsibility to the hearer. They avoid potential charges of carelessness or irresponsibility by not allowing the hearer to over or undervalue the evidence supporting the hedged assertion. Compare Baker 1975 on some related hedges that signal and excuse potential discourse violations. George Lakoff points out in personal communication that responsibility transfer goes even further. Not only can we qualify a statement's evidential status, but we can also evade personal responsibility for the original pre-qualification statement. For example, to the best of our current knowledge rather than to the best of my current knowledge to the extent to which this phenomenon is understood at all, so far as can be judged from work to date, according to the current consensus in the field. This last set of hedges makes criticism or disagreement difficult. Whereas if the speaker had simply evidentially qualified his or her personal evaluation, the hero could easily disagree, though not accuse the speaker of irresponsibility or prevarication. That is when I say, to the best of my knowledge, this, I'm giving you more options to disagree than if I say, to the best of our current knowledge. At the opposite end of the spectrum, hedges such as speaking conservatively commit a speaker to an assertion's high evidential status. Another example is all the evidence points to the conclusion that evidentiality hedges then allow the speaker to modify the normal degree of responsibility for a statement's truths by qualifying its evidential status. Unqualified statements presumably take on a default level of responsibility varying with context. However, evidentiality hedges have another function besides the metalinguistic evaluation usage just described. They also function as pragmatic deference markers. However sure a student may be of one of the following assertions, he or she might have social motivation to mark uncertainty with an evidentiality hedge. But Professor Murray, as far as I can tell, this parallels Andrews's example, which suggests another interpretation. Professor Jones, if I'm not mistaken, haven't Smith's recent results made the atomic charm hypothesis look dubious? When social authority is low, the right to push people's belief systems is correspondingly low. Especially if our hearer may be unwilling to listen and change opinions, we have to be socially careful. 
we have no more authority to command belief changes than any other action against the will of our interlocutor. Evidentiality hedges thus hedge both kinds of authority that underlie an assertion, informational authority or the evidence and social authority. We cannot as readily command belief systems of people higher on the social scale. So that is, I might say, as far as I can tell, either because I am in fact uncertain and I want to indicate that, or because I think I don't have the right to tell you what to believe. And so I say something that gives you the option to not believe what I'm saying. By hedging, I'm giving you more options and therefore I'm failing one of Robin Lakoff's commands for how to be polite. Evidentiality hedges hedge both kinds of authority that underline assertion, informational authority and social authority. This is a natural pairing considering our understanding of assertion as manipulation of belief systems. In a prototypical informational exchange, the hearer is as ignorant and credulous as the speaker is knowledgeable and ready to inform. Who has the upper hand in such an exchange? The knowing and manipulative speaker or the ignorant and passive learner Teaching, a relatively one-way exchange, at least in early stages, has aspects of authority even without a surrounding institutional power structure. To a lesser degree, any assertion has the same inherent power structure. That is, when you tell someone something, you're, you're telling them what to believe, and that is making a demand of them. And that's some of what she's saying we can understand by uh, these politeness hedges. In further support of this analysis, note that a person with both kinds of authority can lay aside either kind with an appropriate evidentiality hedge. A professor who wants to get a point out of a student rather than giving the answer may thus lay aside both aspects of authority in a statement like, but as I understand it, semantics is the study of meaning. So how does it strongly depend on spelling, Mr. Smith? Too many such hedges from the professor would sound sarcastic since it is insincere to deny the existence of one's power position while leaving its broader social presence unchanged. As further evidence, the speakers link assertion with A, request for belief, and B, assumption of an authority position, consider the following hedges. Please believe me. I don't ask anyone to believe this, but I can't expect you to believe me, but these hedges mark unreasonable belief requests, tacitly assuming that an ordinary belief request is just a matter of a course. I can't expect you to believe me needs to be stated, even though our normal right to such an expectation passes unnoticed and unstated. Phrases like the strength of an assertion or the authority for a statement are not random. Both social and informational authority structure our discourse world, and the strength of an assertion depends on both. If either kind of authority is extremely strong, it may overcome opposition from the other. An undergraduate who is very sure of a fact may correct a department chair, and a dean may feel freer than a student to speculate, having more social protection from contradiction. Thus, our cultural model of information as power motivates evidentiality's relationships with politeness and authority. Incidentally, Grice's maxims are often cited as barring assertions that are obvious or well known to the hearer because they are useless and uninformative. However, I've not seen it overtly said that obvious statements are also often insulting. Their rudeness cannot be deduced from their uninformativeness, but follows directly from viewing them as unwarranted assumptions of informational authority. I know better than you. Paul Kay has suggested to me that the rudeness of telling someone what they already know is best compared to the rudeness of giving an unnecessary or redundant gift. If I give someone a bus ticket, I'm assuming that they can't afford to buy the bu uh, take a bu uh, the bus, and so it might be insulting. However, such gifts are only rude if they imply an unwarranted power assumption. If I give you a paperback you own a copy of, I'm only rude if I thereby unjustifiably purported to extend your literary horizons. But if I pay for your bus ticket, which you're presumed capable of buying, then I'm rude unless you ask for help with change. All valuable resources like information confer power on their owners. This view may help explain the Coleman example. Crete is sort of an island, where sort of appears to hedge neither the choice of the word island nor the precision of the truth value, but the act of asserting is weakened to avoid rudeness. That is someone who's saying Crete is sort of an island um, isn't saying 
Crete is very much like an island or something like that. They are just hedging what they're saying to indicate you don't have to believe me. I'm not asking you to believe me, which me, uh, which it may be appropriate if I am not the sort of person who's in a position to tell you things. Conversely, Jeff Frischuren points out to me that the idea of informational authority gives added motivation besides Robin Laycott's rules for seeing questions about ability or willingness as politeness, politer than direct commands. Question form has the inherent courtesy of giving the addressee a presumed informational authority. It is no huge politeness to assume an individual is the best authority on his or her own wishes and abilities. The contrary assumption, however, is ipso facto particularly counter to the rules of politeness unless either camaraderie or unusual social authority overrides politeness. A direct command thus indicates presumed unconcern for whether the addressee has opinions, let alone what they are, and in a domain in which that person is the evident authority, i.e. his or her own internal state. For sure, and also drew my attention to the contrast between an indirect but less polite, the windows open in a rude tone to a hearer who sees the window and a direct but more polite request or command, please close the window. Here I feel the chosen mode of indirectness is more insulting than a direct command. The statement either implies either, one, that the hearer is so unaware of the obvious that the assumption of informational authority is warranted, or two, even greater social authority than a command. The hearer is expected not only to obey, but also to deduce and meet the speaker's wishes before they are stated. The hearer does not seem to mind the open window. Foreman, in a somewhat astonishingly still unpublished paper, informing, reminding, and displaying, elucidates the informational uses of apparently non-informative statements. He would categorize this as an example of informative reminding. For me, the politeness contrast reverses as expected if the windows open is said courteously to a person who somehow mental absorption or a physical barrier just has not noticed but might reasonably share the speaker's concern. These examples demonstrate the complex interplay between informational and social authority in determining politeness. That is, we can say, uh, there's three things you could say. You could say, close the window or please close the window. The window's open or would you mind closing the window? And the latter one is probably the most polite and in other contexts, whether saying the window's open or saying, please close the window, which one of those is more polite depends on whether you think the person already probably shares your concern for being too cold and just hasn't noticed, or whether you think the person does notice and doesn't share your concern. If the person does notice that the window's open and doesn't share your concern, then you saying the window's open to get them to close the window is somehow reminding them of their inferiority to you. Whereas in this other case, it's just reminding them of something that they themselves care about. From the preceding discussion, lying emerges as serious authority abuse. Authority relations structure the prototypical informational exchange, the setting in which lie is defined. As we get further from the simplified world in which the credulous hearer depends on the speaker for some crucial information, truth becomes less relevant and falsehood less reprehensible. In the simplified world, however, barring major reversal of social authority and morality judgments, as in the Gestapo example, falsehood constitutes a deliberate use of authority to harm someone in a weaker, dependent informational position. We thus naturally judge it as immoral, barring exceptional, extenuating circumstances. As salient examples of our view of lying as authority abuse, let me cite the anger of patients lied to by doctors or of children systematically lied to by adults, e.g. about sex. Doctors in particular derive much of their authority from large amounts of knowledge that is not otherwise accessible to patients. By refusing information or misinforming, they can control important decisions for patients. To a lesser degree, any possessor of information can influence or control less knowledgeable uh, hearers. To the extent that we feel people should control themselves, Lying is immoral because it undermines the potential for self-determination. Bach provides a treatment of the social issues involved in lying and deception. One case she analyzes is that of a woman who is the only likely kidney donor for her daughter and overtly willing. Perceiving severe repressed fears in her, 
doctors falsely told her that she was not physically compatible enough with her daughter to be a good donor. This deception robbed her of the chance to confront her fears and make her own decision about giving the kidney. Bach also notes that deception is less frightening if we ourselves have authorized the deceivers and are aware of their tactics. Unmarked traffic control cars voted into use by the community are less threatening than if the police use them without citizens' input. This deep identification of lying with power abuse may explain why, for some people, all lies retain some reprehensibility, however good the motive. Deception and lying. Lies are only a subclass of deception. Any deception in that it induces false beliefs in a credulous hearer is a culpable abuse of informational authority and naturally liable to the same moral charges leveled at a lie. But oddly enough, speakers often feel less immoral if they manage to deceive rather than to lie straight up. Victims, conversely, feel that such a deception is a dirtier trick. They cannot complain of being lied to and resent the deceiver's legal loophole. There, that is, you say something to someone. Uh, I think one classic example is, uh, oh, have you seen John this week? Oh, no, he's been, oh, he's here. Sorry, the question, the, the answer is, oh, he's been sick with mono all week. If you actually did see him, then you were deceptive uh, because you didn't say you didn't see him, but you hid this fact by saying something that seemed to imply that you didn't. There thus seems to be a further folk belief that literal truth and real truth, honest information transmission, are prototypically connected. A literally true statement thus restrains vestigial legality, if not morality, even if it misleads, whereas a deliberate, factually false statement retains some stigma of reprehensibility, even with strong moral justification. Folklore gives magical power to literal truth, and a common folk theory is that law also emphasizes literal truth rather than informativeness. I do not know about modern perjury laws. Some people would find lying to the Gestapo immoral, yet most of them would think it laudable to mislead vi vi uh, villains, saving an innocent victim. In any case, complete dissociation between literal and real truth, or between the latter and morality, is regarded as highly atypical. A common way to mislead is to imply, but not overtly state, the false proposition to be communicated. The overt statement and the false proposition are often linked by Gricean conversational implicature. The utterance is irrelevant or insufficient in context unless the hearer also assumes the unspoken falsehood. In such cases, the speaker could, without self-contradiction, go on to cancel the deceitful implicature. Taking a case from Coleman and Kay, I guess I was remembering this when I gave the example a moment ago. Mary, have you seen Valentino lately? Mary answers, Valentino has been sick with mononucleosis all week. Mary could go on, but I've visited him twice. Part of people's disagreement about the morality of misleading and about whether it constitutes lying may be genuine disagreement about the degree to which a conversational implicature constitutes a statement and hence makes the speaker responsible for having said it. One of the two papers that I mentioned in the description below does assume that any sort of implicature that is false counts as a lie. I don't usually think so though. As Thomason says, some speakers are so sure the implicature was present that they included it in a restatement. Mary said, no, Valentino had been sick. Note she didn't actually say no though. And in fact, when I tried to give this example, I automatically said no, uh, even though I knew that it was important not to. This is one of those things where the implicature is so strongly conveyed that people assume it's part of the statement. The plot thickens as the implicatures become more closely bound to the linguistic form. Such implicatures seem to me to be closer to statements than Mary's implicature about Valentina. Thus, uh, I would predict that an utterance such as some of my students cut class used when not one showed up would impress speakers as closer to a prototypical lie than Mary's statement. So the idea here is when you say some of my students cut class, that is, in fact, literally true if all of the students cut class. However, based on a Gricean informativeness maxim, we assume someone saying some of my students cut class means not all of them did. Uh, however, it would be correct to say some of my students cut class if you were going down a checklist that said 
is it the case that some of your students cut class? I would ch check yes, if all the students did. However, if I told someone, some of my students cut class in a context where there isn't any of that background question asking, I might be seen as having told them that not all of the students showed up. And that seems closer to a lie in some ways than Mary's statement. An even more difficult case is that of presupposed falsehoods. How close to lies are statements such as, he's only a sophomore, but he got into that course, used of a student at a two-year college where sophomores are the most privileged students and said to deceive the hearer about the nature of the college or the course. I personally rate these examples high. I hope in the future to investigate what constitutes stating as well as what constitutes lying. Our cultural model of representation is essential to our understanding of misrepresentation. Cross-cultural parallels. Anthropologists interested in cultural models or linguists interested in culturally framed semantics now ask how universal or culture bound are the cultural models we have just examined. I have used English data like Coleman and Kay, studies of French, Piaget, and German, Wimmer and Perner above, child language agree with each other and are highly compatible with my proposed analysis of the English verb lie. These linguistic communities also share the accompanying moral judgments of lying, probably due to shared understanding of power structures and informational exchange. However, a first glance at more distant cultures shows a startling degree of surface variance as to the morality of misleading or lying. Oakes Keenan discusses the frequency and acceptability of vague or misleading answers to questions in a small Malagasy speaking community. That's the language that, that is primary in Madagascar. Gil Sanan states that successful lying is a major positive status source for males in a Lebanese Arabic speaking community. In what respect do these groups differ from English speakers? My answer is that on, on examination, these cultures differ from ours much less than the isolated statements above might indicate. At least, the differences are not in their understanding of informational exchange, evidence, or abuse of informational power. Oaks Kenyon's Malagasy community, while agreeing with English speakers that information giving is cooperative and useful, has a different idea of when a hearer has a right to such cooperation. Europeans or Americans might think of their own contrast between free goods, any stranger gets a reply to what time is it, and other facts, e.g. one's age or middle name, that need a reason to be told. If someone comes up to you on the street and asks what time it is or what's the direction to something, you'll tell them. But if someone asks what, how old are you or what's your middle name, you're not going to tell them. If they ask what's the direction to your house, you're not going to tell them unless there's good reason that you think they deserve that answer. Malagasy speakers place an even higher power value on information than do English speakers. News is rare in small communities and naturally hoard precious and powerful knowledge. Questioners cannot expect as broad a spectrum of free goods in such a society, and day-to-day -day informational demands have less right to expect compliance. Malagasy speakers are not uncooperative when refusing information could seriously harm, e.g. if asked, where's the doctor by an injured person? Our classic informational exchange setting is just not in place as often as in an English-speaking community. Since Malagasy speakers all know this, their equivocations do not manipulate unsuspecting addressees. The Malagasy community shares basic cultural models of information and truth with English speakers, but evokes them under different circumstances. We might note here that lying to enemies is often culturally accepted. Many English speakers think such lies are less immoral than lies to trusting friends who are owed more sincerity. Coleman and Kay cite speakers who, extending the scale, said Mary did not owe John the truth about Valentino as they were not engaged. In some cultures, lying may be forbidden primarily within the group, but such a culture does not lack our judgment of lies as harmful. Rather, their rule about who should not be harmed is different. So that is, it's not a difference at the linguistic level about lies being harmful. It's a difference at the broader level of help, not harm. Gil Sanan's Lebanese village is an even more complex case. He states that this community thinks that lying is immoral, probably for the same reasons we do. Community members caught lying lose status and honor. However, certain restricted kinds of undetected lies told by adult males can be extremely status productive. First, verbal self-presentation is highly competitive for Lebanese men. So false or unfalsifiable boasts are profitable, though detection causes corresponding status loss. Conventional verbal competition 
gives non-informational aspects to Lebanese boasts. They're not as formalized as e.g. Turkish or urban black American boys boasting or insults. English speakers might lie competitively in other areas and less conventionally, but the Lebanese view of lying is not in serious conflict with our own. The second way a Lebanese man can gain status by lying is to lead another man up the garden path and subsequently reveal the deception. He must avoid detection, or it may be difficult to prove he did not mean to deceive permanently. A garden path is crucially not real lying, since it achieves its goal only by eventual truth revelation. Thus, such deceptions do not show a different idea of lying from ours. But why do these play lies give status? Gil Sanan explains that discernment is a major source of prestige for Lebanese men. A reputation for telling truth from falsehood is valued, especially in religious leaders, but also in any adult male. He tells of a visiting religious leader who upstaged the village religious leader, a man with a long built reputation for discernment, even omniscience. A village man resenting the intruder perpetrated and then publicly revealed a successful minor hoax on him. He left discredited. Lebanese garden path lies are usually less important, but do cause real status gain or loss unlike American April Fools or leg pulling. Lebanese society evidently has conventionalized competitive uses of informational power. Men overtly gain power by forcing false beliefs on others or by seeing through false claims, exposing the author as non-authoritative, dishonorable, or sim simply unsuccessful at one-upping. Serious use of this power by lying would be immoral, but one can conventionally display power without using it as a martial arts victor does not kill, but shows that he has overcome his opponent and could kill. A martial arts victor's status need not indicate corresponding cultural approval of actual killing or assault, nor should status given by garden paths be taken as indicating general social approval of lying. I think this is a really interesting point. Uh, uh, how does displaying your power but not actually using it reflect on our social attitudes towards either the power or the thing that it's a power to do. Very different cultures emerge from this discussion as possessing saliently similar understandings both of lying and of the general power and morality dimensions of informational exchange. This similarity presumably stems from universal aspects of human communication. Where cultures differ appears to be in delimitation of, basis, of basic informational exchange settings and in conventional use of the relevant power, power parameters. Folk models of knowledge and informativeness and the corresponding semantic domains may universally involve strong shared elements. Conclusions. A lie is simply a false statement, but cultural models of information, discourse, and power supply a rich context that makes the use of lie much more complex than this simple definition indicates. Definitions of morally, informationally, or otherwise deviant speech acts follow readily from a de definition of a simplified default speech world. The cultural models in question not only underlie a whole sector of, of, of our vocabulary, but also motivate our social and moral judgments in these areas. They further appear to have strong shared elements cross-culturally. Cultural models underlying linguistic systems are a fairly new area of analysis, though a few people were ahead of the rest of us. Becker in 1975 is a good example. I believe that's the economist, Gary Becker. However, collaboration among linguists, anthropologists, and other social scientists in this area looks increasingly fruitful. My own preference for this approach stems from both its intuitive plausibility. Ethnographers, if not grammarians, have long known that word meanings are interrelated with cultural models, and its explanation of a long-term paradox facing semantic analysts. Word meaning has orderly aspects that make us feel that it ought to be simply formalizable. Yet we all know from bitter experience how readily the complexities of meaning elude reductionistic formal analysis. If the analyst's intuitive feeling that definitions are simple is right, then perhaps much of the fuzziness and complexity lies in the context of meaning rather than in the meaning itself. A better understanding of cultural models, aided by research such as that represented in this volume, is important to lexical semantics. Words do not mean in a vacuum any more than people do. This paper leaves many unresolved problems. It is insufficient to discuss one cultural model or folk theory of speech, here our default model of literal discourse as informational, as if it were largely independent of all the other models relevant to verbal interaction. 
our folk understanding of knowledge also needs more investigation. On the linguistic front, in which cases can we expect the fuzziness of fuzzy semantics to be ultimately locatable in the socio-physical world or in our perception of it, or in the fit between the world and a cultural model? And in which cases, if any, can we expect inherently fuzzy semantics? This last question can be answered only as we learn more about the relationship between linguistic and social, even metaphorical categorization. Just now, I must be content with showing that a simpler semantics of lie follows from an analysis of the cultural models relevant to prevarication. <laughs>